I recently spent two weeks at Marosa Ayahuasca Centre in Peru, and if I had to sum up my experience of the time there, it would be something like 70% of the time would be, wow, this place is great. And the other 30% would be something like, um, what? And that makes this one of the most difficult reviews I've ever written. Because on the one hand, during my time staying with Marosa, I had an overall positive experience. I believe that the centre is run with the best intentions, by good people, and I genuinely want to see it succeed. But on the other hand, there are some significant issues which need addressing, and which definitely had a negative impact on my time there. Also, there are some characteristics of this particular retreat that people should be aware of up front, so that they can make an informed decision if Marosa is the right centre for them in their journey with ayahuasca. With all that said, here is my review of Marosa Ayahuasca Centre in Peru. So just a quick note about myself and how I approach these reviews. The intention here is to give an honest, objective opinion of my experience at the centre as a normal paying guest. I'm not financially associated with this or any other ayahuasca centres, and whenever I do one of these reviews, it's always paid for in full by me, just as it would be for any of you. I don't ask for any special treatment in return for favours, so there is no incentive for me to have an opinion one way or another. My only obligation is to you, to whoever is watching this, to be as honest and unbiased as possible so that you can make up your own minds as to whether this looks like the right fit for you. Over the years, I've been on retreats with about 10 different organisations, and that ranges from purpose-built mega centres to places that were pretty much camping in the woods. So I treat every place on its own merits, and I'm not comparing one directly against another, although I am holding them to a standard of what I believe makes a good retreat. I'm not going to discuss or factor in my personal experiences with the various plant medicines within this review because they are not relevant to my opinion of the retreat itself. After all, you could be at a luxurious mega center and have a shitty psychedelic experience, and you could be staying in a rundown shed in the middle of nowhere and have the most transcendent night of your life. So I'm going to separate out my subjective experiences from my objective opinion of the place itself. No doubt I will make separate videos talking all about that stuff once I've integrated it. And speaking of integration, if you want to know more about that, then go and check out my video on that topic, which I'll link to up there somewhere. Okay, so hopefully that sets the scene and goes some way to validating that I have some experience when it comes to evaluating these retreats. Last point, just before we get into the main topic, this review is split into different sections, which cover areas like the facilities, the culture, the people, etc. I'm gonna go into quite a lot of detail because I want to make sure I'm painting a fair picture of what my experience was like at Marosa. I'll leave timestamps in the description below to all those different sections, but if you just wanna hear my final thoughts, then feel free to skip ahead. But if you are actually considering going to Marosa, then I would ask that you watch the full thing because there is a lot of stuff here for you to consider and evaluate against whether this center would be right for you. Okay, so let's kick things off with some background and basic information about the place. Marosa is an ayahuasca retreat located about an hour's drive outside of Iquitos in Peru, so it's roughly about here. I visited the centre in June 2022 for two weeks, and during that time I did eight ayahuasca ceremonies and what is known as a master plant dieta, along with some other plant medicines like rapé, purgatives, floral baths and cambo, so I got to try a lot of different things during my time here. The group size is maxed at around 12 guests, but while I was there, it fluctuated between 8 and 12. The normal price for a two-week stay like this is currently $1,850, which includes everything I just listed, along with all your meals and accommodation. Although I booked during a time that they were offering a discount, so the price I paid was around $1,600. This means that in terms of costs, even without the discount, this is one of the least expensive retreats that I've ever been on. And purely from a financial point of view, it's extremely good value for what you get included. The center is predominantly owned by a Shipibo family, the most visible of which is Maestra Angela, who administers most of the plant medicines that you'll take during your stay here, and her son-in-law Tony, who is the main go-to guy for the day-to-day -day operation of the center. 
The western face of the retreat is a guy called Jordan Adams who handles things like bookings and the website, and we'll be talking a little bit more about Jordan later on. Now, during my visit though, there were also two other Shipibo shamans during the ceremonies, and there were several other members of the family who do things like cooking, cleaning, and laundry. So the overall vibe is that this is a family-run, very traditional retreat. Now, one word that often crops up when people inquiring about retreat centers is the word authentic, as in, is this place authentic? What they tend to mean by that is, is this place really a traditional experience, or is it just looking to cash in on the hype around ayahuasca? And if that's your concern, then I would say that the experience at Marosa is definitely authentic, perhaps even too authentic for some people, because life at Marosa is very simple. You sleep, you eat, you partake of medicine, you do ceremony, and that is pretty much it. There aren't really any other activities or a huge amount of socializing that goes on. So if what you're looking for is a group bonding experience with loads of things to do, this might not be a cup of tea. But for me as a bit of an introvert who is there primarily to focus on myself, it suited me just fine. And I actually think Marosa should lean into this aspect more because staying here doesn't feel like you're staying at a typical retreat center. It feels like you're visiting a shamanic village. And by that, I mean the maestros are literally living right there on the site, and you can feel that in the atmosphere of the place. This is primarily their home, and you are a guest there. Now, the positive of that is that if you're looking to immerse yourself deep into this way of life, then yeah, this is it. The downside to this is that what is happening around you is happening regardless, and it can feel like it doesn't particularly matter if you are there or not. Like I said, this is not a curated experience in that no one is gonna tell you what is happening and when. It's simply a case of being in the right place at the right time and stuff will happen, but the onus is on you to kind of look after yourself and be there. Now, some people might like that, but for others, I can imagine it can feel a little bit disconnected, and I'll go into that in more detail in the next section. Now, I do think it's worth mentioning that Marosa is a pretty new center in that although it opened in 2019, that was just before the pandemic hit. So realistically, it wasn't taking many customers until the end of 2021. So in that regard, this is a fledgling center, which is still working out a lot of the details for what is needed to host groups. And what I mean by that will become apparent as we get through this review. So let's talk about the facilities at Marosa. As with most jungle retreats, then the facilities at Marosa are very basic, but everything you need is provided for and overall, I was happy with the comfort level. The layout of the compound looks something like this. At the top of the complex is the main dining room, the maloka, the showers, the toilets, and the big house where the shamans live with their families. You then cross this bridge over a stream to get where all the guests stay in these separate tambo huts, with each hut accommodating two people. The tambo huts are surprisingly comfortable, and in my opinion, are better than some of the more expensive centers due to them having full-size, comfortable beds, a very consistent electricity supply, and each hut having its own outdoor decking area with a hammock for chilling during the day. Now, part of what made the experience in these huts so comfortable was that the amount of blood-sucking insects in this particular area of the jungle was minimal, so there was no need for mosquito nets around the bed, and getting bitten by insects was a rare occurrence rather than a daily inevitability. Yes, you will still get bitten by insects, but honestly, it's not much more than I would get bitten on a typical summer's day at home in Switzerland. So yeah, guest accommodation gets a big thumbs up. Although it does have one downside. You see, if we look again at the layout, then you'll notice that the guest huts are all here, while the toilets are on the other side of the bridge here. And that walk to get there, even with my big, long, lanky legs, takes about 90 seconds. You can see a sped up version of the trek from my hut to the bathroom playing here, just to give you an idea of the distance involved. Now this is certainly not a deal breaker, but it's something to keep in mind as to where your comfort zone is when looking at a retreat like this, particularly when it involves ayahuasca, which can vastly increase the frequency at which you need to take a shit. So doing this walk multiple times an hour 
is not uncommon. Also factoring that some of those journeys might be happening in the middle of the night when it's absolutely pitch black with the untamed jungle just outside of your field of vision. On top of that, factor in how you'll feel about doing this bathroom walk if it just so happens to be pouring with rain as it frequently does in the Amazon. Because, you know, walking through a jungle rainstorm for 90 seconds will have you completely piss wet through and then you'll have to walk back again. Like I said, whether or not this is a deal breaker for you will depend on how adventurous you are. But on a serious note, it does mean that for anyone who has problems with mobility or who has bowel issues which require frequent trips to the bathroom should put some serious consideration into whether this centre will be right for them. Now I did speak to the centre about the possibility of building some additional bathrooms closer to the guest huts and they said that this was something they plan on doing in the future. So hopefully this situation will change. But until then, Going to the bathroom, yeah, it's a bit of a chore. Moving on to the other facilities, they have a nice big maloka with plenty of space which is used for ceremonies and I'll talk some more about that later. The dining room is basic but functional and it does exactly what it's supposed to do. The jungle ayahuasca diet is notoriously bland and so you have to balance your expectations around the kind of food that you're going to be eating. But that said, I really enjoyed the food at Morosa. There was always plenty of food to go around, plenty of fresh food, so I never went hungry and the food quality was top notch with enough varieties can be managed and most importantly it felt clean and healthy. I did have some special diet requirements because I don't eat fish and the centre was happy to accommodate that and I just have to add that the guy who made all the meals was one of the nicest and friendliest people I've ever met. Finally in terms of facilities, while I was there the centre had just started expanding out the stream which runs through the middle of the complex into a kind of mini swimming lagoon. Now the footage I'm showing here is from a different swimming area on a neighbouring property. So while this one at Morosa will not be exactly like this, it is my understanding that they are aiming for the same kind of thing. So like a natural flowing swimming area rather than a constructed pool. And I think they said that we be finished within the next couple of weeks. Now, there is something I need to mention, which strictly speaking is not part of Morosa's facilities, but it does need highlighting. And this is the most relevant section to put it under. The road by which you get to the centre and the manner in which you traverse it is an ordeal. What I mean by this is that once you get off the main highway which comes from Iquitos, you have to go down what can only be described as a dirt track for about the next 15 to 20 minutes and the only way to get across this is by tuk-tuk. Now that in itself would be fine except this is no average dirt road. Like the experience of getting to the centre is like being on a rickety wooden roller coaster and if that sounds like fun then believe me it isn't. You know I have been on off-road motorbike tracks that were easier to navigate than this. It has got some incredibly steep hills both up and down, it's an extremely uncomfortable ride and in several places you would have to get out and help push the tuk-tuk up the hill. So like I said it's definitely authentic but maybe a little bit too authentic for some people. Also, like I just mentioned with the bathrooms, try and factor in what that situation looks like if it's raining and you're sliding about in the mud trying to push a tuk-tuk up a hill. Trust me, it soon loses its charm and raises questions about what would happen in a worst case scenario. Now while I was there, there was some work being done to improve the quality of the road and I was glad to see that happening because it is sorely needed. But realistically, this is a big task that is going to take a considerable amount of time. So again, factor this into your decision process before booking this centre. Can you take being banged about on the equivalent of a rickety roller coaster for 20 minutes? If not, then maybe this is not the centre for you, at least until they get that road evened out. Now let's move on to the people and the culture. Okay, here is where things start to get tricky. I want to say straight away that I truly believe that the team at Morosa have their heart in the right place. To me, these seem like good people who are really trying and I completely support what they are doing. But there are several things that I had major issues with and which had a negative impact on my time there. Now again, I really want to stress that these are not bad people, nor do I think there is anything sinister going on. The problem is that the team there at Moroso, if you could even call it a team, is so incredibly understaffed and disorganised 
That stuff either just doesn't happen or it happens in a way that feels chaotic or like they don't give a shit or like they don't know what they're doing. Now, after talking with them, I am fairly certain that they do give a shit. But nevertheless, during my time there, stuff was happening that stressed me out. And stress is not something I expect to happen on a healing medicinal retreat. In order to illustrate this, I'm going to have to give a few examples. And I think you'll see that these things are all connected together. So my first impression when we pulled up at the centre, I could not help but notice there was a lot of garbage just strewn about all over the place. Like everywhere I looked, there was plastic bottles, empty packets of laundry detergent, plastic bag, beer bottles. And this is in the main pathways of the retreat. So it's not like it was something tucked out of sight. You know, for a center which makes a big deal on its website about how it's connected to nature and does not use artificial products, I found this pretty shocking. You know, I would have hoped that the people running this center care enough about their environment not to drop litter all over it. But at the very least, I would have hoped they would clean it up before paying guests arrive in order to make a good impression. But there it was, and it looked awful. Following on from that, upon arrival, there was no welcome, no introduction, no friendly meeting with the staff telling us who is who, no one showed us around, no one told us the rules of the place, what we can or can't do. When things happen, there was nothing. We were basically just left to figure it out. There was no dedicated one-on-one -on -one time with either the staff or the shamans. We could explain what you'd come for or what your intention was. You know, if you had any questions about the medicine, what to do if you need help during ceremony, nothing. And that situation did not change during my entire two week stay at Marosa, even after I pointed this out on multiple occasions. Still today, as I write this review, I am none the wiser about what the rules and the guidelines are for this center because nobody has taken the time to explain it to me. So after this non-introduction, a guy arrives to take us to our tambo hut and take our payment for the retreat. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this review, I booked this retreat at a time when they were offering a discount, but nobody had told this guy. So he started getting a bit pissy as if I was like trying to rip him off or shortchange him. And yeah, I just do not need this kind of stressful shit just because you guys cannot organize yourselves. There's fucking garbage everywhere. Nobody's telling us anything. And now I'm being made to feel like a cunt over a discount that you guys offered. So yeah, as far as first impressions go, this was bad. Now, the reason for this wasn't obvious at first, but it became apparent as the days went on. There was no one facilitating the retreat. As in, during my time at Marosa, there was no one person whose job it was to put the well-being of the guests first and to ensure that the healing process that people have invested their time, money and mental well-being in is running smoothly. So let me just restate that to be absolutely clear. At Marosa, during the time that I was there, there were no facilitators. And let's unpack exactly what I mean by that. I mean, what even is a facilitator? Well, if we look at the dictionary definition, then we get the following. Facilitator, someone who helps to make something happen or who makes it easier. Someone who is employed to make a process easier or to help people reach a solution without getting directly involved in the process. Basically, someone whose role it is to look after the needs of the group and provide help and guidance in whatever shape or form is needed, whether it's from translating Spanish so that you can communicate with the shaman, or if you need help getting to the bathroom during the ceremony. That person in that role is not there. Now this might sound strange because surely there is someone in charge or someone you can talk to. And the answer is, yeah, kind of, but not really. I mean, there is Tony who owns a center who is uh, maybe 25% of the time. And then there are two people who describe themselves as facilitators, but are actually just long-term paying guests who are going through their own process with the medicines. So as a result, they're also often unavailable. And as they will frequently tell you, they don't actually work there. It's more like they are helping out as and when they can, rather than having that role as their main responsibility. And again, I have to stress the point. These are good people who will help you if they can. So I'm not talking about a bunch of negligent assholes here, but the fact is, is that no one is in that facilitator or leadership role. 
And that is a big problem. Now, this becomes really obvious when it comes down to the ayahuasca ceremonies, because like I just stated, it is often, not always, but often the case that there are no facilitators to help the guests. Sometimes Tony would be there to help out, but often he wouldn't be. And those two so-called facilitators I just mentioned would be drinking full doses of ayahuasca and be completely out of it along with the rest of us. Sometimes even they would be needing help themselves. So let me give you a real life example that occurred on multiple nights. The lady on the mat next to mine was in her 60s and she needed help to go to the bathroom. What is the protocol for her to ask for help? She doesn't know because just like me, nobody gave her any guidance as to what to do and there is no one actually there who can offer help anyway. Tony isn't on site that night and the two facilitators are completely out of it. So after a while, I notice that she's struggling. So I go and ask her if she's okay. I help her to her feet, I escort her to the bathroom, wait with her while she does her thing, and then bring her back to her mat. All that while I have a head full of ayahuasca and I'm going through my own process. Now it's worth noting that a trip to the bathroom during an ayahuasca ceremony is not as simple as it sounds. At Morosa, it involves walking down some stairs, navigating past one of the resident dogs who likes to sleep on the Maloka steps, which means that it occasionally gets stood on by unaware guests. Then you have to stumble across some very uneven terrain to make it to the bathroom. And again, let's hope it's not raining. My point is that it's not an easy trip. And even with my help, this lady was struggling. Now I'm actually glad I was able to be there for her and it felt good to help out, but I have to be blunt here. That's not my fucking job. Just like it's not my job to have to ask every conceivable question just because nobody could get their shit organised and tell the guests what the guidelines are for this centre. What if I hadn't been capable of helping her out? Who else would have done it? Yeah, I don't know. The end result of this is that there were several nights that I was going into ceremony with this kind of stuff on my mind, either feeling confused, annoyed, or just wondering if I should take a low dose so that I can be available to help people who need it. It completely got in the way of my own process. And that is the opposite of what a retreat should do. A retreat should enable a person to go through their own journey. And in that regard, I feel let down by Marosa. Another thing to note is that this is not the kind of place where groups start together on one fixed day, spend the week together and then move on. We had people dropping in and dropping out of the group on Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday, so you do not have this cohesive sense of a group bonding and moving through the process together. It's a little bit disjointed. And perhaps that goes some way to explaining why it was so difficult for them to give a consistent welcome to the centre. One final example of the gaps in the organisation was when it came to leaving. None of the staff seemed on the ball about when the guests needed to leave. And people started stressing out because they had flights that day leaving in a few hours. Who was on top of the situation, managing the needs of the guests for a smooth and peaceful exit from the retreat? Nobody. It was handled in such a cavalier way that it was visibly frustrating people and made what should be a really simple, fond goodbye into something unnecessarily chaotic. I could give a fairly long list of other similar unnecessary events which cast a shadow over this retreat, but at that point it would just be me complaining, so I'll move on. But I will just say that this lack of organisation, lack of consistent facilitation and lack of leadership was an ongoing source of frustration and concern throughout the entire two weeks day. And there's no nice way of saying it, it really pissed me off. As far as I'm concerned, this stuff is the absolute hospitality basics. So if you can't look after the land without covering it in garbage, and you can't make your paying guests feel welcome, and you don't have the staff to help people during ceremony, then you should probably have a good long think about what kind of experience you are providing. Now I will say in their defense that I have raised all these points to the team at Morosa. They apologized and they stated they will take steps to address it. For things like the garbage on the floor, they did make an effort to clean it all up. So after a couple of days, that particular issue was fixed. Outside of the medicine activities and the meal times, there isn't really anything else that happens on this retreat. So for the majority of the time, you pretty much need to keep yourself entertained. They do host an arts and craft market on one day during the week where you can buy shipibo goods made by the shamans and their families. 
and they do offer an optional riverboat trip to see some local wildlife like snakes, monkeys and sloths, and that costs an additional $100. And to be honest, this was fine for me. When I booked this particular retreat, what I had in mind was some long periods of quiet rest and introspection, and that was what I got. I just spent my days reading, meditating, listening to podcasts, just really taking it easy, which was exactly what I wanted. I will say that there aren't really any social spaces for just hanging out and mingling with your fellow guests. You can always use the dining room in the Maloka, but it's not exactly the same as a dedicated social area. Now, one thing that particularly stood out at this retreat is that it doesn't have any kind of group share activity where people talk about their experience with the medicine. Now, I know some people think group share is a bit tedious, so if you're one of those, then you're in luck. If, however, you find value in listening to others talk about what they went through, well, it just doesn't happen. And sure, you can always approach someone and ask them about it, but that's not the same as holding a space for people to give voice to the crazy experiences that they're going through. And again, you could probably trace this back to the lack of dedicated facilitators because there's no one to step up and actually lead this kind of gathering. So let's talk about the ceremonies and the medicine. So apart from the topic of facilitation, which I already covered, then the ceremonies themselves in terms of what happens are absolutely great. Like during my time there at the center, there were three maestros present during each ceremony and each would sing in their own unique styles and it was just amazing. You know, I personally adore the Shapibo tradition and their style of Ikaros and each maestro would go around and sit in front of each person and sing directly at them, which was awesome. So in terms of the healing and spiritual experience from the maestros to me as a recipient and how all that was orchestrated, then Marosa absolutely nailed it. I think this is worth driving home because if the thing that is most important to you is what happens within this ceremony and you are comfortable with looking after yourself, then this center has you covered. You know, what happens in that maloka from a shamanic point of view is just as good as what happens at other centers which charge two or three times as much as what Marosa do. And because the group size is smaller, you have plenty of space between the mats and you feel like you have a good connection with the shamans and the Ikaros. As well as ayahuasca, there were various other kinds of medicine given such as liquid rapé, cambo, purgatives, vapor baths, floral baths, and each of these was handled really well in terms of receiving the medicine. But again, the lack of organization is a problem here because Nobody would tell you that these things were actually happening. It's like they just decide to do it. And if you are there, great. But if you miss out, then tough shit. But you had no way of knowing it was happening anyway. And this happened to me on several occasions. And this is what I mean when I said at the beginning that stuff just happens around you and it doesn't feel like it matters if you are there or not. And again, this kind of total self-reliance might be exactly what you're looking for. So it's not necessarily a negative point, but it is something to be aware of. Personally, I think this could be fixed quite easily just by adding a blackboard in the dining room and writing on there what is happening on any given day or ring a little bell when there's an activity happening so people know something's going on. But yeah, in terms of the ayahuasca ceremonies and the various other plants that you get to try during your time, you definitely get your money's worth. No. I will preemptively answer one question which always crops up on the comments on these reviews. Is the ayahuasca strong? Honestly, it's not the strongest ayahuasca I've ever drank on a cup by cup comparison. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. But that said, you can always ask for a bigger cup and they will happily accommodate you. So I don't think it really makes a difference. Just drink a cup, find where your baseline is. And if you need more, just ask for it. Okay, how to sum all of this up? Marosa is a diamond in the rough, in that when you look at it from certain angles, then this center is not only up there with the best of them, it actually carves its own unique niche with this kind of shamanic village vibe. The people are great, the ceremonies are awesome, the accommodation is comfortable, the location is beautiful and peaceful. There is a lot to love about this place, and after spending two weeks there, it has a place in my heart. But, like I said, it's a diamond in the rough. And when you turn it around slightly and look at it from a different angle, then you can see that it clearly needs a lot more work. It seems obvious to me that they are going through some growing pains after the pandemic. But as much as I want to, I cannot give them a free pass. They really need someone to step up and manage the guests because their failure to do so is derailing all their good work. 
and it's creating unnecessary stress. Now, in the worst case scenario, I think that them doing ceremony with 10 guests in the room and no sober facilitators is completely unacceptable. Now, maybe this stuff that I mentioned would be less of a big deal to you than it was to me, and that's for you to decide. But hey, this is my review, and I have to be truthful about how I feel about my time there. So, with all that said, and trying to be as fair and as balanced as possible, did I have an overall positive experience at Marosa? Yes. What made it a positive experience? Well, it was the small group size, the simplicity of the place, the shamans, the food, the ayahuasca ceremonies, and the wide variety of medicine experiences. Now, can I honestly recommend Marosa to everyone as a complete win-win, totally awesome experience? No. And that pains me to say that, because the heart of this place is so good, but the execution was so haphazard that there is no way I can sit here and universally declare, guys, go to Marosa, this is the place to go. I cannot say that as much as I might want to. I mean, I spent two weeks out there and it's hard not to become attached to the people and the experience as a whole, but I have to be objective here. Now, to be absolutely clear, this is not to say that Marosa is a bad center, but if someone is asking me the question, where would you recommend? And the choice is between center A, that is clean of garbage, makes you feel welcome, has staff available to help the guests, and is experienced and organized enough to make your time there feel effortless, or if the second choice is centre B, which doesn't do any of that stuff, then obviously I'm going to recommend centre A. And unfortunately, centre A clearly is not Morosa. Now, as I've mentioned, this is still a young centre which is finding its feet, and I genuinely see them looking to improve. When I got home, I had a long conversation with Jordan Adams, who helps to run Marosa, and he was a great guy. He took everything on board, he wasn't defensive, he acknowledged the issues, and he said he's going to take steps to address them. And I genuinely believe that he, along with the other people at Marosa, are going to improve. And I can totally imagine going back there in a year and having a vastly different and smoother experience. So pay attention to the date on this video, because while what I am saying is accurate of my experience in June 2022, it might not be the case in 2023. You know, time will tell. And yeah, maybe at some point I will need to do a follow-up to this review. Okay, so if I would not recommend this center to everyone, then to whom would I recommend it? Well, I would say that if you're an experienced traveler, preferably one who speaks some Spanish, with an adventurous spirit who genuinely doesn't mind being way out of their comfort zone and has the emotional and psychological fortitude to completely look after themselves, including during ayahuasca ceremonies, then you will probably have a good experience at Marosa. Likewise, for anyone who has wanted to completely immerse themselves in that shamanic lifestyle and is genuinely looking for an authentic plant medicine experience, yeah, look no further. Like I said at the beginning, being here is more like living in a shamanic village than staying at a typical retreat center. Okay, so who would I absolutely not recommend this center to? Anyone who has issues with stress or anxiety, which might be exacerbated by the lack of hands-on support. Anyone who has mobility problems or for whom long walks over uneven terrain would be an issue, especially if it's muddy and slippery. Anyone who has injuries or infirmities which would be antagonized by the bumpy off-road trip needed to get to the center. Seriously, if you're the kind of person that finds fur-grown rides painful, then this is probably not the right place for you. Now, I have to mention the price because I know from talking to people in my community that this is one of the things that makes Morosa so attractive. You know, at a time when other retreats are costing $2,000 per week or $3,000 per week, or in some cases, $5,000 per week, then to see a place like Marosa offering the level of comfort and medicines that they do for $1,000 per week with the kind of small group sizes that they have, yeah, that is pretty amazing. You know, despite my criticisms of the place, this is not a cash grab. This is the real deal. And you can see people putting their souls into this place. And with just a few tweaks, this place could be something truly special. So here is my advice for Marosa. Start your guests on the same day. Give them a consistent welcome. Have someone whose role it is to look after them throughout the entire retreat. And doing this will not only make their experience better, 
but it will make your lives easier because you won't have to deal with stressed out guests. Be better at communicating what is going on. A simple blackboard in a public space can really help here. Recognize that you are not some small haphazard center winging it from day to day by the seat of your pants. You are hosting groups of 10 plus people who have traveled thousands of miles to be there and they might be pinning their emotional and psychological health on what happens within this space that you are providing. You have a responsibility to these people, also to yourself and to the tradition that you are representing. And as someone who loves these traditions and wants to see you guys succeed, please, 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 please take all of this on board. And I hope that in a year or so, I'll be recording an update to this video about how much you've turned it all around. So that is it for this retreat review. I had a lot to say and I hope you found it useful. If you enjoyed this video, then please like and subscribe and check out this playlist linked above, which contains all my previous reviews of ayahuasca and other plant medicine retreats. You know, I would love to hear the opinion of you guys in the comments below. Have you been to Marosa? Are you planning on going there? Do you agree or disagree with what I said about the place? Let me know, let's have a chat about it. I wanna give a shout out to everyone who supports this channel, especially those who do so via Patreon or direct donation. And you'll see those people mentioned here somewhere. But also to everyone who's taken the time to watch an advert here on YouTube before this video. As I'm sure you were, these retreats do have a certain cost associated with them. And so the support from all of you guys in whatever shape or form helps mitigate that. So again, thanks to all of you. For anyone who wants to get in touch, then all my contact details like email and social media are here on my YouTube profile page, as well as in the description text on the video. So reach out to me on Discord or Reddit or Instagram. I also do fairly frequent live streams where you can call in and have a chat, so look out for them. And yeah, I think that is about it. So I will catch you guys next time on Adeptus Psychonautica.